Number two begins at the end, at a place we all know of, but don't like to think about. It's the end of the line for your number twos, along with everything else that gets flushed down the pipes. So the wastewater treatment here at Logan City Council is a little different. They can turn your waste into something special. These small black lumps are a little different to the charcoal you get after your barbecue, because this stuff is called biochar. Biochar could be the answer to the problem you didn't even know existed. And here to help us care a little bit more about our number twos is Joe Johnson. This trick has been here since around the 1970s. It deals with sewage from all of Logan, um, so about 300,000 people. That's a lot of poo, Joe. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yes. So the biosolids that we have originally were 34,000 tonnes of very wet, sticky material, really not that great to be able to pump, do anything with. It's just not fun. And this wet, sticky sludge is hiding a problem, something buried deep inside, something that we need to get rid of. And here to help us understand is agricultural scientist Payal Sinha. Everything that we are consuming, which is, you know, one-time use, we're throwing away, these are all plastics that either end up in landfill or scary part is if we are consuming something in it, it's ending up in us. And it is everywhere. It is in our food, you know, how we love to put our food in the microwave, like easy to go meals. So every time we heat up plastic or freeze it, it breaks off thousands of microplastics that go into our food and on this cute baby spoon. Yes, that contains microplastics. Exactly how much plastic are we eating? We're consuming about a credit card a month in plastics. Is there anything else we have to be worried about? Yes, PFAS is fluoroalkyl substances. It's long fluorines, it doesn't break down in the environment. It's a really that kind of forever chemical. It is getting banned from being used in things, but it's like fire hatters. Non-stick frying pan. Microwave popcorn. It's a useful chemical. It's just not great for us. Now that we know how bad all this stuff is that we just flushed away without thinking, what did we actually do with the biosolids before biochar? Biosolids was a waste. It was something that we had to pay someone to dispose of it. Previously, 36 trucks, and we're going up to the Darling Down, so six trucks per day, six days a week. So Joe, how much does Logan City Council actually pay for our sludgy poop to be taken away? So at the time when we were doing the planning report, it was about $1.8 million per year. $1.8 million a year? That's enough to make anyone clench their butt cheeks. That's risen to around 2.4 to nearly 3 million. What? Joe, please tell me that's a joke so I can stop clenching. When biosolids are trucked out to the Darling Downs or to anywhere for a land application, it was a traditional process that put nutrients back into the soil. However, with things like sludge mineralization, which is the release of carbon dioxide and methane back into the atmosphere, it's not a great thing on, on the carbon scale. If we went our traditional route, it's about 160,000 tonnes per annum of carbon into the atmosphere. Let me do some quick math. Carry the floor. Square root of nine. <laughs> yep, it's just as I thought. That's a lot of carbon, Joe. The other point of it is that waste water treatment plants capture everything. Like, it's not like we can say, no, you cannot put that rinse aid down the sink or any of those types of things. We, we're going to get it. So when you apply biosolids to land, you are applying <laughs> these trace elements that come through and then they build up. Those really, really small plastic, they do get end up back in the soil. So after discussing the dangers of microplastics, and the pitfalls of PFAS and the drawbacks of biosolids, we've arrived at the part of the story where our main character has to spill the beans. Tell us your secrets, Joe. How do you make biochar? <laughs> Please. To get to biochar, we have to dry it. Firstly, it goes to what we call the dewatering stage. So the same sort of thing as what you'd see with a washing machine. It then goes to the drying stage, which is the same as an oven, it's just on a pellet. 
questions for the end of the session. Next, we're trying to find Michael Duke. Oh, it's just recorded? Or? Oh, it's just recorded, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Professor Michael Duke, and I'm from the Institute for Sustainable Industries in Liverpool City's Victoria University in Melbourne. Um, I really hope you're enjoying the third NICE Summit um, at UTS, um, and you, I hope Hello everybody, my name is Professor Michael Duke and I'm from the Institute for Sustainable Industries in Liverpool City's Victoria University in Melbourne. Um, I really hope you're enjoying the third NICE Summit um, at UTS um, and you, I hope you enjoy my presentation, Nitrogen Recovery from Wastewater Using Membranes. So how we might design our membrane systems uh, takes into consideration the way in which we treat our wastewater and what we do uh, towards a more sustainable circular economy approach. So currently um, we treat our wastewater uh, from industry or from communities um, to meet certain discharge requirements at a cost um, in terms of chemicals and uh, electricity or energy uh, before we discharge the environment. However, as we continue to grow, this is uh, becoming uh, not, it's not, it's not sustainable anymore. 
And so what we can do is look at recovering our, our compounds from our wastewater in a financially viable way, um, and as in a means to, to remove these compounds and pay for the cost of the equipment that does it. Um, but obviously these systems uh, cannot uh, achieve complete removal. That's a requirement to the environmental health um, reasons. And so then we need to decontaminate. And um, in considering how we might achieve this uh, with a complete membrane uh, solution, um, by putting these two systems together, um, we can show that um, the system which recovers the resources um, can do this in a way uh, that uh, not only pays for itself, but also pays for the decontamination as well before, so that uh, nothing around, um, uh, the, the, no contaminants are sent to the environment at all. Um, I'm going to show you today uh, work on uh, membrane processes to, um, to recover the, the nitrogen in the means by which uh, it's uh, economically viable and at the same time reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So to recover nitrogen from membranes, there's several ways to do it, and I'm going to focus on the membrane contact or membrane distillation uh, approach. So commercially, you can um, 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 obtain the membranes from 3M, um, called um, these membrane contactors called uh, transmembrane uh, chemisorption, which effectively use an acid stripping solution on the inside of the membrane to remove the ammonia from the wastewater. Um, membrane distillation um, is very similar to membrane contactors in that they use a similar type of membrane, which is hydrophobic, that doesn't let liquid through, but does let the ammonia, volatile ammonia through, um, but does this uh, uh, not necessarily using acid. In this case, it uh, uses a vacuum to strip the ammonium out, a sweet gas, or an indirect contact membrane distillation. It just uses a water. So when we looked at, uh, looked at um, applying uh, the membrane distillation approach, through some industry wastewaters in partnership with Greater Western Water. Um, we first took a sample from uh, an industry power station which had a non exchange, exchange regeneration waste, and then we also took an Arabic digester effluent from our food waste our site. Um, and uh, when we applied uh, the membrane distillation at the bench scale, um, we were able to show that you could um, strip the ammonium from these all these wastewaters. And the interesting finding is that even the only exchange waste were pH 6 showed a removal, where anything above one this enrichment factor shows that you can strip it out of the, the wastewater. Um, however, when we tried to replicate the results on a synthetic sample, um, the pH 7 ammonia water solution um, showed that uh, you uh, don't actually strip it from the, the water, you instead concentrate it where you can see the enrichment factor is below one. Once adjusted to pH 11, uh, it does come out as you would expect because now the, uh, the ammonium is now the ammonia free ammonia form and therefore it's volatile and can be removed. Um, however, uh, it's, it, even at, uh, so when you have an electrolyte in the system, so we're trying to increase the complexity to try and find out what's happening. Well, the industry samples do let it out. We thought the electrolytes might be responsible, but no, um, by adding sodium chloride and sodium sulfate, you make your return to concentrating. But it wasn't until we added carbonate that we found that um, that's where we got the similar results to um, the industry samples. So in the presence of carbonate, um, something is happening to the chemistry that allows you to um, strip the ammonium out of the, out of the wastewater. So to understand this, we, we completed a study um, to, to explain what's occurring through the chemistry of the, the ammonium water system uh, in, coupled with, uh, with carbonates. So we just essentially um, uh, followed a very well-known um, theory in membrane processes, which um, um, is known as polarization, which occurs um, when something is removed from the membrane selectively, what's left behind, as you would expect, it concentrates near the surface. So in the case of uh, membrane distillation with, um, uh, with uh, ammonia um, and carbonates present, um, while you're removing the water, um, you also remove carbon dioxide from the from the water in its uh, carbon dioxide, free carbon dioxide form. Um, and in doing so, um, you can create at the interface of the membrane a rise in pH from the, in this case, the, this is the ion exchange regen solution, which um, which we use as an example, rises from pH 6 up to pH 8.5, where you can then cause the ammonia to be released. And this is occurring because as this carbon dioxide is being removed, um, the carbonate um, equilibrium shifts. Um, in doing so, it consumes uh, a proton um, and it can take this from the ammonium molecule, leaving behind an ammonium molecule, which is free to then come through the membrane. And 
so we found uh, this was a good explanation to what um, we were doing with the industry samples in the presence of company, which we called uh, pH polarization buffering. Then we moved to a pilot trial um, um, in partnership with uh, Central Highlands Water, where in, with funding in, uh, from Intelligent Water Networks, uh, where we then installed the pilot plant on the side of Ballarat South Wastewater Treatment Plant. So the, the treatment plant uh, has an activated sludge process which uses aeration, um, and the sludge up to the clarifies is then digested anaerobically. Um, the solids are then removed and sent off as biosolids, and then the filtrate is um, dosed with lime, uh, trimmer phosphate, and normally this uh, ammonium uh, rich uh, water then is then sent to the head of the plant and becomes part of its nitrogen load. Instead, we can apply membrane distillation to extract the ammonium uh, at this point and therefore reduce the ammonium load to the plant. We also looked at struvite um, as well for colleague Dimit Navaratna, um, but I'm just going to show you um, how this, this case where we located the membrane distillation after existing lime removal. So here's the, the pilot plant on site in a 20 foot container. Um, next to the lime dosing facility is the membrane uh, pilot plant, which was a DuPont MemCore membrane, which has a hydrophobic polypropylene polyfibers with an area of 27.8 square meters. And we removed a bit of ammonium um, with a vacuum pump um, and then um, passed that through some sulfuric acid to capture as uh, ammonium sulfate. So in evaluating um, how the performance uh, went, um, we were able to uh, uh, measure a 93% or greater than 93% reduction in nitrogen, um, which was uh, then recovered as ammonium sulfate. Um, and uh, this reduction showed that you could achieve um, uh, effectively discharge limits uh, below the discharge limits of, um, of the nitrogen in that first quarter. So it worked quite well over the trial period. Um, we were trying different modes of operation. Um, but the key thing from this pilot trial was to demonstrate um, how it was to compare with the existing means to remove nutrients through the aeration system or the activated sludge system. So we took the, the, uh, the cost of the energy for the aeration blowers, uh, which they just upgraded to, to more efficient systems at 50 cents uh, per kilogram of nitrogen removed. And when we did the evaluation of the vacuum membrane distillation system, we showed that there's a reduction in the electricity <coughs> demand and therefore the cost um, by, uh, by using this approach. Um, this in turn had also a reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> so in conclusion, um, uh, we need a circular economy approach um, for energy and greenhouse gas reduction in, uh, associated with the nitrogen fixation and the nutrient removal and wastewater treatment. Membrane contactors and membrane distillation uh, can effectively recover as an ammonium salt or just a, even just as ammonium, ammonium solution. Um, when we started looking at this a few years ago, we saw an inconsistency between the real and synthetic samples, um, which revealed that a, uh, with the presence of carbon, an effect we call pH polarization buffering, um, which effectively means that uh, the nitrogen recovery can occur at even low uh, acid pHs. Um, in when carbon is present in which most wastewater samples it is. And then we're able to show pilot, uh, pilot trials um, that um, we can recover ammonium from an existing wastewater treatment plant operation and reduce the energy costs in greenhouse gas emissions compared to the conventional activated sludge process. So thank you very much. <coughs> questions but uh, yeah we we'll, we'll certainly will try we'll uh, report the questions to him later on all right so next one up uh, Howard one from the University of Queensland will be presenting evaluating the impact of sustainable nitrogen management on carbon footprint all right thank you yeah. um, so uh, today I'll be presenting on behalf of our research team on the progress um, that we have done um, since the start of the project. And uh, um, so the team at UQ is led by Associate Professor Liu Ye. And unfortunately, he, uh, she cannot be here. She's uh, on business trips. So I'll be presenting this on behalf of the whole team. 
Um, yeah, so the project that we at UQ works on is basically a sub-project of my part um, called Evaluating the Impact of Sustainable Nitrogen Management on Carbon Footprint. Um, so uh, our team at UQ have been working with um, most major Australian water utilities to study their greenhouse gas emissions, um, especially to facilitate their um, ambition to achieve net zero emissions. And net zero emissions is really a thing now in Australia. Many utilities, especially those in Victoria, I think you all will be know very a lot about that. So by 2030, uh, utilities, especially in Victoria and other states, need to achieve net zero. Um, so utilities are extremely interested in looking at te te technological options to help them to achieve such pathway. And so actually we were um, asked by our industry partner, um, Ben, Ben Bryan from Icon Water. So he heard about this project, this nice hub project, and uh, they really have a set target to reach net zero. So he, so he asked us, um, well, if we have um, this your integration in Canberra, will that help us to achieve net zero? And yeah, we said, we don't know, it's uh, actually very, it's quite tricky. Like what Stefano is going to do in, in Melbourne is if you take that nitrogen off, um, you have less nitrogen coming to the plants. And it's not necessarily a linear relationship. You have like 20% less nitrogen, you have 20% less nitrous oxide emission. It may not be that case. Um, so. What we want to do is we want to firstly we will um, try to establish a baseline for our industry partners. We will do full scale monitoring of their greenhouse gas emissions, and here our focus is really uh, nitrous oxide emissions. And for 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 those uh, that who are not that familiar with uh, with water treatment plants, uh, nitrous oxide represents majority of the scope one emissions and emitted from our virtual nitrogen removal process. And so we will try to firstly uh, establish a baseline and do full scale monitoring at our industry partners with water treatment plants. And then we'll try to understand um, scenarios if we take this urine off and how would that may impact the treatment plants uh, carbon footprint. Uh, and lastly, this was actually um, inspired by a discussion that we had during last summit with Sean um, about this AOB, NOB story. So actually, when I, when I did my PhD some years ago, my PhD was all about NOB inhibition. So we tried to inhibit NOB to do a partial nitrization animals or nitration. And never thought the other way around. Maybe oh, there's actually an application that we need to encourage NOB growth. So the last part is really inspired by the, by the uh, discussions we've shown last time. And uh, after then, we try to uh, come up with our ideas if we can um, get a more stable partial nitrification process. Um, so start with the, uh, the, the, the big one, uh, so full-scale green, greenhouse gas monitoring project. So this is in collaboration with Melbourne Water and also an uh, industry partner of this nice hub. Um, so we studied their uh, western treatment plants um, based in Werribee. Um, so in these western treatment plants, they have uh, anaerobic lagoon, which remove a majority of their carbon and recover that as energy. <coughs> Um, but still the nitrogen um, flows in after the anaerobic lagoon. And then uh, the plant we studied basically here at the right hand side <coughs> is a step feed full-scale full um, nitrogen removal plant. Um, it, it's four steps, so the emission from those, uh, this tank is actually very dynamic. So well, we have set up a full-scale M4 or greenhouse gas emission monitoring full-scale setup. So um, in those four steps, step feed system, you can see um, it's tiny, you know, but in the red circle, <coughs> you can see in the middle of each aerobic zone, we have one uh, gas pool capturing the gas emissions. And then the gas is sent to a, con a gas conditioning unit and then sent to an analyzer system, um, analyzing the ga gas composition, including uh, nitrous oxide, methane, and carbon dioxide. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a liquid uh, M2O monitoring. So the, right, the, the bottom right-hand side shows an, an M2O analyzer. So to, to understand the dissolved M2O concentrations and to understand the generation. <coughs> um, 
Yeah, so that's the full scale setup. Uh, only two slides, but behind this is a lot of efforts. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, next time, I will present you some the monitoring results. We already have some, but I will I'll present that more comprehensively after um, comprehensive analysis. Um, so, with this analysis, analysis we have, we still tr try to understand if we take that nitrogen off, how this might impact the greenhouse gas emissions. And unfortunately, we don't have a reactor system like Stefano has already, but I see there's a good collaboration opportunity. We can help you with your study and then we can get some data from you. Um, so without such data available right now, what we can only do is what we can only do is currently want to do a carbon footprint analysis, just anal uh, an analyzing different scenarios um, for current commercial uh, wastewater treatment process and the emerging um, with world treatment processes and some blue sky technologies, and we want want to see how the urine separation and treatment technologies how that may couple with the with world treatment plant processes in terms of um, its impact on uh, the scope one greenhouse gas emissions as well as scope two greenhouse gas emissions. So the scenarios we uh, we considered here includes um, the NPR urine treatment and, uh, technology as well as electrochemical treatment technology. And for the conventional process, we considered MLE process, which is mostly used. And for immersion one, we considered a high reactivity slide and partial nitrogen animal process. And the blue sky technology, we consider anaerobic MDR with um, ammonia of, uh, absorption, uh, absorption by zeolites. And this, actually, this blue sky technology was the winner of uh, Melbourne Waters um, net zero competition. Um, so they really want, want this to be included. Um, and so this is still sort of ongoing. We are, we are trying to model um, if we have uh, less urine in um, with water and plant, plant, how does that impact uh, scope one emission? Um, but overall, we can see, uh, uh, obviously, when you take urine off, you will generate less uh, scope one emissions because basically you have less nitrogen loading. Um, but on, on the other hand, um, from literature, it shows um, MDR, etc., still produce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so how to weigh that? Um, there is also some balancing point to, to, to meet. Um, so I'm not going to present to you in details of these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I'll present this in CEC conference in more details. Um, yeah, welcome to the, to the presentations. Um, and lastly is this um, a new process uh, we want to talk about that we're trying to um, study at UQ. So um, as Sean was, was just talking about AOB, NOB uh, growth in MDR, um, you, it may subject to um, process failure mainly due to inhibition to uh, nitrile oxidizing bacteria. Uh, this is due to the pH change and the formation of free nitrous acid or free ammonia which affected MOB activity and which in return promote the accumulation of nitrile and free nitrous acid which would be in MOB. And we've, we've seen quite a lot of studies trying to avoid inhibition on, on MOB by regulating environmental factors. Um, so that basically shows uh, the nitrification pathway ammonia by MOB to nitrile and then by MOB oxidized to nitrate. So what we come up with the idea is um, instead of regulating environmental factors to pre prevent inhibition, can we try to encourage the growth of MOB within the system? Um, yeah, so we, we want to use a very recent uh, um, partial denitrification process. Um, so what we, we mean by this using this partial denitrification process is normally we have ammonia oxidized to nitrile and then nitrate, and we, we want to de denitrify part of the nitrate traits back to nitrite by heterotrophic bacteria, and then we hope that denitrification stops at nitrite. So in this case, we will have this nitrite produced not only by AOB, but also by heterotrophic bacteria. So we have more supply of nitrite, so that gives more substrate for MOB to grow, to grow within the system. So we hope that we can get this loop of nitrile, nitrile production within a urine treatment so that we can encourage the growth of MOB. And so how do we plan to achieve such partial denitrification in urine, urine treatment? 
Um, so it's based on three hypotheses. Um, firstly, um, studies reported and high pH condition would actually favor the accumulation of nitrite in the nitrification process. This has been tested in previous studies, and uh, urine actually contains high pH. So we uh, we we want to operate a urine treatment reactor under relatively high pH condition, actually pH eight, um, to for the um, uh, to favor the nit nit partial denitrification. But yeah, as you may want to ask or question or challenge us, if you have high pH and under urine condition, you will have free ammonia that causes inhibition again. And so that's another, um, that's why we chose to use MABR process. So MABR process, um, illustration in the middle, um, basically is a counter diffusion biofilm system where you supply oxygen from the inner um, lumen and the substrate, say ammonium, etc., are from the bulk liquid, so it's counter diffusion. So oxygen from the uh, actually are from the inside, and the benefits of this is you have ammonium oxidizing bacteria in the inner part, and the substrate comes to from the outer uh, the, the outer layer. And AOB when it does its work, it can it produce proton. So studies in MABR already show in the lab right hand side, even when the pH at outside in the bulk liquid is high, due to this proton pr production by AOB, the pH the, in the inner side is way lower than the bulk liquid. Like the right hand side uh, um, illustration shows, it can be one to 1.5 uh, difference of pH. So we hope in this design, even if we have high pH at the outer layer, we promote the partial denitrification by heterotroph in the in the outer layer and within the membrane itself, the pH inside is relatively low uh, or neutral, um, about seven, so it will not um, induce too much FMA or FA inhibition. And so we have set up a reactor um, to, to test this, um, but yeah, growing biofilm is still this time. And hopefully next time we can talk about this um, lab result as well. Um, so in addition to the research progress, we also have some progress in education. We hosted the visit of uh, associate professor Jia Meng from Harbin Institute of Technology, and also a PhD student, um, Meng Qi, uh, from Harbin Institute of Technology. So actually, um, associate professor Jia Meng is uh, the one who did the uh, environmental analysis, and Ms. Meng uh, Qifu uh, is a PhD student who is doing the MABR study, experimental study. And we also have recently recruited a PhD student uh, to come in in October. And yeah, that's all from us. And I want to acknowledge our industry partners, especially our PI, Dr. Peter Wardrobe and Claire, as well as James Lewis, Peter, and Demos Dijon from Melbourne Water, and Benjamin Bryan from Icon Water. Um, and of course, the formal support of ARC and my partners. The last talk for this session, Professor Jason Fryer from uh, ISF UTS, talking about governance for a thriving circular nutrient value chain. Over to you. going to change the direction here a little bit. Um, so this is focus on governance. So we're coming out a bit or to the broader picture. Um, we've had a lot today about technologies and other processes. Um, so the first thing I wanted just to acknowledge is that we're at the beginning of our process, our ISF, the Institute for Sustainable Futures. Our focus is socio-technical, particularly governance and marketing. And our team includes the three people who are presented here, but also Kerry, who's sitting next to Dana over there. Um, and they'll be presenting later this afternoon on the marketing side. So the first slide, this is just starting, we're gonna start in small and then slowly move out into a broader system, in a sense. So what, we will see this diagram reappear several times, and Dana's probably better explaining this diagram than me. Um, she's been working on it for a while. But what it points out is the thriving circular organic value chain of the, this economy. 
and it runs through quite a few steps. And governance requires us, in a sense, to look and explore at how we're working on all these different stages of this economy. And where are we on that, and which parts of that, and they all have to flow together to actually create an overall process. What we've heard today is there's a lot of um, niche activity, and that's really important. Niche activity is important, but it's the beginning of the process. And we heard Abraham talking about the point, um, you know, sometimes stay in those niches. You want to stay away from the regulation as fast, as long as possible. Uh, but what ends up happening is niches do become mainstream eventually. And as things become more and more mainstream, regulators and other bodies and governance bodies start getting into the process and it becomes bigger and bigger process. So in a sense, we're in this process now. We're sort of, I suppose, at the beginning of this process. But what I wanted to talk about today is our specific question around government, which is identifying effective governance frameworks requires institutions or rules that allow diverse stakeholders to integrate well into a circular nutrient economy. Um, what I mean by rules here or institutions is not buildings, it's all the different rules out there. So there's many different. There's black letter law running through to regulation, but then at the other extreme, a rule can be the basic comment which a lot of people might have around this, which is, yuck. Um, that has big power, that's a norm, but it's in society and it's driving things. So you get these extreme sets of pieces of governance and they all come together. And that recently, I'm just stepping right back here, so in a sense, that re led recently to the OECD, it was a couple of years ago now, doing this study, which some people might have seen, other people may not have, but it was starting to identify across the 51 cities and regions, which included Melbourne, not actually Sydney, um, when they were doing Australia, but um, it looked at all the different areas of governance that are, are important in this area, and these are some of them. So it led from capacity gaps, which I think a lot of people have been talking about today. So that's the lack of technical solutions and also things like lack of human resources. And we're developing all of those at the moment. Right through to awareness gaps, we're having some comments about that today. That's the sort of yuck factor. You know, how do we get people to think over past that? And there were some examples in the video which showed, you know, the whole idea of carbon economies. You're doing something good for the society, for the economy. It's about changing the language and providing adequate information. There's also policy gaps, the sort of lack of holistic visions, lack of political will, um, right the way through to funding gaps. Um, I'm, sure in, I'm assuming these slides will be available later, so I'm not going to read every single one of these. Um, this just gives a, an example of the, how significant these gaps are considered to be within these 51 cities and regions at the point that this was surveyed. It shows that, for example, insufficient financial resources was high. I'm not going to run through again all these percentages, but it just gives you an insight into how much of these issues at the governance level are a significant challenge. Um, so where are we? So if you just look back at that slide, I'm going to come back and just point out some of these elements, but there's a whole heap of elements in a sense, you see sitting around the nutrient circular economy, which we're trying to do, we're trying to create, and one that's viable and thriving, what we've got is a whole heap of different types of rules that we would be analysing to try and understand. From things like payoff rules, which are around socialisation information, right the way through to boundary rules, who can play in a nutrient circular economy. For example, what's the jurisdiction um, when you're doing this work, and who's in control? So all these different factors play into this and control these situations. That's just going back to, the, the red is just going back to those points that were being raised in the OECD report. And it highlights, for example, in terms of jurisdiction, there's in, inadequate regulatory frameworks, incoherent regulation across levels of government, lack of cohesion, cohesive visions. So that's just in this idea of jurisdictions and controls over these processes. Right the way through to, for example, down the ballot, the one I mentioned before, the yuck factor, it could be called, which is the cultural barriers or lack of awareness. And we need to overcome all of these if we're going to make these economies successful. But it gets even more, this is just looking at one 
thriving nuclear, sorry, thriving, thriving circular nutrient value trains. <laughs> um, sorry, it's after cheering a session for too long. Um, and so when we're looking at this, this is one example in one jurisdiction, for example. But what ends up happening is we suddenly go out a little bit further again. So we've gone out from just the chain itself to the context of one chain to now looking more broadly where across the world and different contexts there's multiple governance systems operating on any one context quite often for example there's resource systems different types of resource systems operating different sorts of approaches to resources and very different actors there also there's broader rules here we've been talking about the social rules there's also the ecological rules happening out there, which we're coming into contact with at the moment. Planetary issues, climate change, they're actually, the planet has its own rules, environmental rules, which it's imposing upon us. So just to give you some examples, this is just to bring it out a little bit further again. So we've got multiple contexts now imposing on one system, but in that, we then have, for example, in terms of ecological rules, we have climate change, we have natural resource availability, which is restricting on the human systems and regulatory systems, which then come and impact on the thriving circular nutrient value chains. Um, we have different types of law systems and governance systems operating, Super, supranational, for example, national, local, um, state in Australia. We're fabulous. One great thing about Australia is we've managed to have a European system in a country of only 25, what is it, 22 or 23 million people. We have three levels of government. Um, so, what I just wanted to highlight is the purpose of this, just quickly today, was to give you that broader context. That is what we're looking at, in a sense. And without considering all this broader context, whilst we're focused on the niche, you can get away with a lot. <laughs> but as we move more and more to actually taking it mainstream, these processes, that's when the challenges occur. Um, so, just to finish, I wanted to introduce Jordan, who's going to help, help us address some of these issues, and we're probably going to get a small part of what I just showed you addressed. But in that context, I'd just like to point out, it's taken us a little while to find our team, because we had to find experts in marketing and law. So what I'll do is, I, rather than reading about Jordan, I'll just ask Jordan to stand up for a minute to explain his background. <laughs> It's a bit rough when you've got someone in the audience and you're telling them about them. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Jordan will also be presenting tomorrow on some of his initial work. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Jordan. Um, I work at the Institute for Sustainable Futures in the Resource Stewardship Team. Uh, but I've recently, yeah, been accepted for a PhD. It's quite a nice hub. So I'll be starting in November looking at the governance of thriving circular nutrient economies. Uh, yeah, I have a background in socio-legal research. I studied law here at UTS. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm really looking to bring some of those expertise to this research um, because some of the stuff we've talked about today, these are technological problems, but to really scale a circular nutrient economy um, to address some of the climate challenges that we're facing, um, that's going to be a governance problem as well and a marketing problem. So. Yeah, I'm excited to, to start this new chapter. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to point out that Dan will be presenting in the following session on the marketing component of ISX work. <laughs> All right, so why don't you stay here and I call upon all the speakers to <coughs> come back uh, for a Q&A discussion session. Coming up, uh, separating us from uh, an action-packed afternoon tea. Don't forget the action afternoon tea coming right after this in 30 minutes. <laughs> stay activated. We're locking the door. So, so obviously Michael is not here, but uh, perhaps Sean is close enough to Michael that he can uh, answer <laughs> some of the questions you might have for Michael. Um, uh, 
Floor is open. There you go. And? Well, no one else, so I, I gave everyone. <laughs> the biochar, I think that was such an impressive video about the biochar, it's brilliant, we're going to make that go viral in my thesis. Um, but I was wondering if you were ever doing any outreach, like um, letting people come into the facility to have a look, because, and just getting it into the Logan News. I'm a resident of Logan, so I expect to see it in there. <laughs> uh, so we haven't done any um, of mm. getting things like um, the community in, into the group um, and facility. Last year we did about 460 people going through the 1970s wastewater treatment plant, which I thought was actually hilarious. Um, but we're getting lots of people very, very interested in it. Um, there's a Logan Eco Action Festival that we um, go to, so we're trying to do a lot of community um, work. The thing with biochar is still under the end of waste code for biochars at the moment. So as much as we'd like to give a way to the public to be able to use and, and that type of stuff. We just can't do that at the moment. No. Um, so until we get an end waste code for biochar, which is um, in draft at the moment, um, we'll see where that, where that sits. So that's one of those regulatory hurdles? Yes. So talk to Jordan here. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we've got the code. Um, it's just um, it's just going to be setting the precedent, I suppose, for the other states. So it's causing a little bit of um, fun at the moment. <laughs> So when we're in the biochar, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just wondering, <laughs> energy-wise, does it run itself? Like you, you mentioned that the bioenergy is used to dry the sludge, so they, yep. does that come from the so biochar process So it's heat energy neutral, um, um, so we do use for some um, diesel and gas to start up and um, that type of stuff. Um, electrical energy, we have a 1.1 megawatt solar farm on site, so that's enough to get us to ultimate design, so it's double the size of what you see there. Brilliant. Oh, Cheryl. Uh, you said that uh, 54 something percent of the mm. bio, it's biochar. Mm. I just wonder what is the risk? What? What? You just said the, oh. the, the 50 something percent is the biochar, right? Yeah. So what are the other products? Um, so it's the carbon side of it. Um, so there's other um, macro and micronutrients in it, so nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, <coughs> all of those types of in, in the char itself. The carbon content's around 46 to 50 percent. Okay, so it's carbon. Yeah. So does the nitrogen stays in it? Because I thought no. it might. No. It's all volatile. As soon as you heat it and try and reach you, it's volatilized. And this no, not by the Yeah. That's what we're testing. So it's N2, the final product? And N2 gas? <laughs> or? Um, where it's um, being dosed. So it's not going through the gas. Um, there's a, a minimal that's going through the stack that you see on, on there, um, but we're dosing for NOx and um, N2. So we've actually measured that for our carbon emissions because we are carbon neutral as a council, which is one of those issues. Yes, who would have thought? Um, <laughs> oh, just a, a little question. You gave a really impressive work. Uh, but, uh, yeah, ju just a question. You, you mentioned about this. Uh, uh, biochar process to potentially solve the microfluidants issue. Did you do any tests to confirm that? Mm. Did you still get any uh, PFAS, microplastics, <laughs> whatever, the microfluidants uh, in, the, in your biochar product? And uh, uh, second question is about uh, the market for this biochar. Do you, uh, what you are going to do with this biochar? You, Get it to farms for free, or you use it for any uh, manufacture any other products, or anything you plan to do, or you are doing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I forgot to have another one. <laughs> um, okay, so to answer the first one, um, we measure the biosolids going in. It has PFAS, the biochar going out and non-detectable. Um, and then we've had to do mass balance on the PFAS, so um, under our license, because we've got a destruction rate of 99.999% um, as our license limit. So we're able to actually measure that and um, show that it doesn't go through the airstreams or any of the other um, wet scrub or any of those types of um, processes as well. Um, 
other micro microplastics and nanoplastics. Uh, we've measured them um, in the biosolids and in the demonstration plant, which was a different biosolids and a different drying technique. Um, we were saying that it was about 60% reduction. Um, in our current, um, it's between 84% and 90% reduction in our micro and nanoplastics. So that's a huge reduction um, that we're seeing. Um, now, oh, markets. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> end waste code for biochar is what we're waiting for at the moment because at the moment we have to go under the end waste code for biosolids and there's only a certain amount of people that we can actually sell to. Um, they are interested in it, um, but it's sort of looking at the short term, medium term and long term markets at the moment. So at the moment, short term is really around the agricultural um, sector and so we've got lots of potential buyers. Um, we're just waiting for that code to come through so we can actually sell it to them. Um, they really want it for the carbon content, the water holding capacity, you name it. It's actually a really, really good product. Um, and we know how it, it kind of reacts all the work that Bernadette's been doing. Um, really illustrates why it's so good for the agricultural sector. Long term, yes, there is stuff that we can use it for that is higher value. Um, but it does mean that we have to do more process with it, right? So if we go down the activated carbon, there's other parts of that process that we would have to go and through um, to, to go into that market. But it's definitely one of these areas. Um, and then we've got about two concreting companies that are testing it at the moment so that we can go into concreting as well. But again, you have to look at that carbon cascade and where is it beneficial and where is it actually then that carbon Just, just a, I don't know, Mike, just a question around volumes per year. How much are you producing and what's the scale up? Is there a scale up um, happening? <laughs> yeah, um, so biosolids, 34,000 tonnes per annum is what we're um, going through. Mm. Um, we were estimating around 3,000 tonnes per annum of biochar, but it's around 4,100 tonnes per annum that we're um, doing at the moment. Um, we have that stored on site, which is a mountain of char, but it looks great and it is <laughs> great for those toilets. Um, so the other thing with that is you're right. When we're looking at companies that are thinking around concreting or those really big agricultural sector, um, we've really got to say about what scale or volume we actually have to sell. Um, at the moment, we're probably the biggest biochar um, producer around. Um, which it also makes it quite hard because you're saying this is what the product is. Um, but yes, we are looking at scaling up. And so there's, um, we're putting in a third dryer in the next um, 12 months. Um, that's not only to look at things like biosolids, but other feedstocks um, and looking at other technologies as well. So that's going to be quite fun. I think just a question for Jason. Um, I think. Um, you mentioned, I guess, based on the survey, the financial risk or constraint, I saw it was the highest percentage. And I just wonder, does that translate to this, that perhaps government needs to incentivize or give, subsidize this technology? Is it what it means? Or is no, it the no, expectation it, it that... It could mean a range of things. Mm -hmm. um, it could mean, basically, um, risk factor in terms of, there's risk factors in terms of not having regulations and not having frameworks around it. Um, there were several in that financial sector section. I mean, I think one of the bigger ones, issues at the moment, which was just being mentioned then, is volume. What are appropriate volumes to make something marketable? So there's many, those sort of, the question you're saying is actually interlinked with several of those other issues, I think, there. And it's about what do we need um, to actually take things to a more mainstream basis. If that makes sense in terms of volume, <laughs> the point which is being made. And also then people will invest once they know there's a stability in the market and those sort of things. Um, so it's sort of a, like I said, I suppose what, in a sense, what we focus on is that system in a sense. Everything's interlinked rather than being individual or a singular item, even though it was shown there for simplicity reasons to make it uh, doable. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Thank you. Matthew. Oh, thanks to all the presenters. Um, really appreciate hearing from everyone. Um, I've spoken already to Joe about. Um, number of things, a couple of 
voice for a sec, but, um, so I do, but I do have another question. Um, our sector is not really known for moving particularly fast. No one wants to be the first mover on new technology. On the other hand, we live just up the road, and I look at Logan Water, and you seem to have moved fairly quickly. Um, why do you think that is? Like, what are what are the drivers? <laughs> what, are, what are the arguments that you're making in your business um, around biochar that made a step up? That made a step up, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, expanding the capacity and looking at alternative uh, base stocks as well. So I'd love to. Whatever you're prepared to share at the moment, um, otherwise we can chat off, chat off one. Well, yeah, Logan's a little bit of an interesting one because we've got different drivers. Um, so at the moment, as I was saying, we're carbon neutral, um, which is I've heard of for a council and water utility. Um, and the reason being is, is that we decided to do that in 2019 that we were going to be carbon neutral by 2022. Um, that pushed us into a lot of new technologies to go, okay, how do we do this and do this sustainably and reputationally? So things like the gasification facility tick those boxes. So we actually had something to grab onto and say, one of our key drivers is um, to be sustainable, prudent and efficient. Um, and around that is these green projects. So that's where gasification kind of sits. Um, the other thing with this and it's, it comes back to how you do business cases. Um, we're very, we're, yes, we are very risk adverse, um, and there's reasons behind that. This is, this is public money, um, so we don't really um, like going and using technologies and that type of stuff at full scale. Um, this one moved quite fast because we were able to do the demonstration plant and then the full scale, um, and we got a lot of support from the water industry to do so. so. And we got arena funding of 6.23 million for the demo plant, so and the thing, so that was a, that was a good push. Um, the next kind of phases that we're looking at are really around um, looking at things like the marketability first. So we've got that prior to actually going in and going, can we actually make marketable products? Um, the other point that I will make is that um, that project stacked up by itself because of the haulage. Um, so we would have been able to pay off that um, the facility in 10 years. And that's the kind of thing where we go, how do we do that? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Sean. So my question to Haoren. I'm just wondering, your technology is relatively very new. So do you believe the, what's the, your expectation of the uh, nitrification for AOV, NOV from your MAVI system? And what could be the, if you make a scale up for this mm -hmm. one, what could be the major hurdle do you think that you can face? Um, so, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it should work. Some people already used MABR for urine treatment, yeah. um, but still the same sort of issue that the instability of this process um, uh, subject to FMA, FA conditions. But um, yeah, if the, all the theory works out, and oh, there's one point I didn't actually say was uh, the carbon. Um, yeah, we, we are unsure whether the carbon in urine is easily is easily biodegradable to, um, to facilitate this proposed part of the process. Um, yeah, so we ordered some creatine, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, to see whether we can um, get what we observed with uh, like acetate or other easily biodegradable carbon. Um, but if that works out, and then theoretically it should work, but then, and also upscale of MABR seems to be um, fairly feasible. Um, yeah, we currently also working with a road corp on their uh, pilot MABR. Also, work. actually demonstration scale six hundred cubes per day, and a lot of other utilities are also using MABR, like uh, um, Don Quality is uh, doing full scale, mm -hmm. and the Water Care in New Zealand is also doing full scale and also pilot scale. So it seems like um, a durable technology, and if that coupled with a new operation, coupled with the urine treatment, seems like a, a scale, can be scaled up technology. Okay. So in urine, we've got uh, two thirds of the COD is acetate, so. Oh, acetate? Yeah. Oh, 
uh, after hydrolysis. Oh, not pre-treated. Initially, yeah. but after hydrolysis. So we are, Sean and I, we work with hydrolyzed urine. It's pretty much all acetate. Oh, that's really good to know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 because I, I didn't read your paper. I thought that's just synthetic. So Look, it is very small organic compounds. Yeah. Oh, so I just okay. had another thought. Uh, so we've been talking about ammonia loss the whole day, and uh, you're looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and you normally we don't have any issues with ammonia in wastewater treatment systems because there's very little of it and the pH is low, but here we actually do get quite a bit. What's the fate of ammonia after it's in the atmosphere? Like, what does it convert to and how long does it take and does it have a greenhouse gas potential itself? I think ammonia does not have greenhouse gas potential, but where is it? It's yeah, an H or that. It's like there's some units. Oh, an H, yeah. If you convert it. Yeah, oh. it's very easily, it's less stressful in terms of time. Less of the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like some terrible. Ammonia. Yeah, it's sort of like waste water in my process. But anyway, yeah, that's the so, yeah. That's something to account. So, we need to. MABR, another benefit is you have less ammonium coming because there's no plastic free to bubble yeah. less. So you would have some ammonium coming through the membrane to the membrane source, but then that's high, highly uh, concentrated. So you can still absorb that badly if it is, if it is MABR. But if it is just bubble aeration, it's hard to control the vapor. Some of the stuff that uh, Sean and I make, uh, or Abraham has been using in Vermont, we put it straight onto the soil, and if you say 10% volatilizes, what's the GHG potential of that? And, uh, and so are we actually doing worse overall? Yeah, that's a good point. Something for you to study so you can help us on that. Matthew? <laughs> Just to comment on that, um, you're also displacing, if you're reusing your nutrients, you're also displacing the production of that nutrient somewhere else in the value chain. So you should be able to count that against um, your your product and the net um, net value, I guess, um, so carbon potential across the value chain that you're actually displacing some of that. And we, you know, nitrogen, 10 or 12 kilowatt hours a kilogram, phosphorus is like 14 or 16 or something kilowatt hours per kilogram. So you can, Obviously, it depends on the background energy mix that they're using to produce those chemicals. But certainly, there's got to look at the, in my opinion, got to look at the whole, um, the whole cycle. So not yeah. just the wastewater treatment part of it. Yeah. Hey, Bram. Okay. I have a question for Haran about the um, the environmental analysis of urine diversion. And um, I'm curious about the, um, the capital investment in urine diversion um, equipment, like the urine diverting toilets or, or even just the urine diverting piping and tanks, because there's a very low throughput in that per, you know, per unit tank or pipe in all the houses. And I wonder if that was part of the environmental analysis of implementing urine diversion. Uh, no, we didn't consider that, that infrastructure part. We only considered the urine treatment part, like MBR or electro. So the infrastructure of having urine collection was not included in the, in the scope. Any further questions? Um, but, um, maybe further to that. Uh, so that's also like what Matthew was talking about. It's sort of a counter. You would have, if you have these infrastructure built within buildings, then you delay the future upgrade of wastewater treatment plants because of that <laughs> reduced to nitrogen. But yeah, maybe a comparison of that would be interesting. Yeah, that would be fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Are you all satisfied? Yeah. We're a few minutes early, but uh, thankfully, uh, Aldo here was. Uh, show you a couple of slides so that you go into morning tea prepared. Mm -hmm. So we're going to let the speakers <laughs> off the hook. <laughs> we invite 
Aldo Meto to give you an overview of uh, afternoon tea. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, we are going to have croissant and no. some coffee. No, just kidding. <laughs> thank you for in, for joining us in this afternoon tea with action. So my name is Aldo Meto. Actually, I'm from the University of São Paulo in Brazil where I lead a circular economy innovation center. And I'm here as a visiting professor at Griffith University, invited by Professor Cara. So I want, first of, first of all, to thank all of you for this opportunity, for the directors of, of the uh, NICE centers, and especially for Professor Cara for this invitation. And so, what we are going to try to, to do this, and I'm talking in behalf of all of this team that we are working um, from, from all of this year, um, understanding and trying to integrate actually all of those um, areas, fields that um, we are talking and here today and we are all researching. So, the integration, as Sean said, and from uh, an um, perspective, it was um, so important that we can come from those multi-disciplinary um, approach for a really transdisciplinary result solution approach. So <coughs> the idea is that we can integrate of all of our knowledge to put this in practice in on the best way. So we are trying to do those road mapping workshop so this activity actually is the first part of um, two um, um, meetings that's today we are going to address and to identify some drivers and barriers um, for this circular um, ecosystem um, on nutrients and then tomorrow, based on this, on the conference, we are going to work on thematic groups to identify some opportunities and actors. So the, the goal for today is to identify the current situations and based, of course, on, on the research that we are developing and in, on our knowledge. And and then and we are going to, to identify for the four dimensions. So you, you all can see here, we have four banners. Here we have the economic, technological, social, cultural there, and environmental and health. And what we are going to do is to pick up with those, the, we are going to have some facilitators in, for each of those um, fields. So um, Professor um, Sayad is going to be the one from economic, um, Professor Kara from technological, Professor Anne, environmental and health, everybody knows you yet, <laughs> and Dana, and together with Jordan, will be um, the facilitator for the social cultural dimension. So what you are going to do, please, um, is you are going to pick up one of those you can use more than one, so you can for the drivers and the barriers. And with those facilitators, you write down the main one that you think for those dimensions. You, of course, can go for as many dimensions you would like. And then you just get back to the facilitator and they are going to plug and we are going to see in the end how it's going to look and some general issues that we all talk today um, from Jason about governance, so a lot of aspects from sociocultural as acceptance and, and changing the mindset and rules and regulations, from environmental aspects and, from, and health risks and the technological aspects, a lot of um, aspects we, 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 we heard from today, and uh, economic also from Syed, from the whole economic aspect. So what are so the main um, drivers and barriers? And from drivers, we are um, just indicating that includes internal strength, 
external influences, forces, potentials, positive impacts, some, something that influences in, in a positive way. And of course, in the other side, the barriers that influence in the negative ways, as the internal weakness, threats, risks, difficulties, or even negative impacts, potential one that can occur. So, well, I would like to thank you for this collaborative action, this uh, um, important issues. And as it is part of a research that would like also to to give some um, um, publication, we are going to 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 ask you please to after you just feel, of course, read and, and feel the ethical um, application this, that's saying in general that we are going to use this for the research purpose and your name is not going to be in any of the publication. We are going actually to have some photos for just to uh, have all the, 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 the documentation, but with no names and and for the only for the research purpose. So thank you and let's um, collaborate and integrate our knowledge and trying to to start road mapping and pathing this pathway for a more sustainable nutrient circular ecosystem. Thank you. Go move around, right? So we'll yes. go technology, yes. economics, health, socioeconomic, and elbow each other out of the way. <laughs> grab a driver, grab a family. <coughs> yeah. And go. Yeah. All right. Get your coffee. And you do that while eating and drinking. And <laughs> 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 thanks, guys. Thanks, Aldo. So that uh, really brings us to 3:10, which is the, the perfect time. So enjoy the afternoon tea and uh, be active. And don't forget to bring more caffeine to Sean's setup by visiting the toilet. <laughs> Yeah,